Good morning, Kevin. Welcome to uh, the Bank of Thailand 80s uh, anniversary conference, uh, which is jointly uh, hosted by uh, uh, Bank of Thailand and the BIS. And thank you uh, very much uh, for taking uh, your time and speaking with us. Um, uh, I would like to begin um, by um, uh, asking you uh, some questions about your recent book, um, uh, the avoidable uh, war, uh, the dangers of a uh, catastrophic uh, conflict um, between the US uh, and China. So in your book, uh, you talk about um, a, a way forward uh, for the United States and China to avoid a, a superpower conflict uh, where you focus on how to pursue a um, common strategic framework for the future that might be accepted uh, by both sides um, to reduce the risk of uh, catastrophe. So uh, uh, on Amazon, um, I saw there are two different uh, versions of the book's uh, cover page. Uh, one uh, has a uh, question mark after the title, uh, The Avoidable War, and the other one uh, does not have. So um, my first question uh, now uh, is uh, for you, uh, is, a, is that, is the question mark uh, very, very important? Well, thank you very much for the question and greetings to all of our friends in uh, the Kingdom of Thailand. Uh, and congratulations to the Central Bank of Thailand on its 80th anniversary. Uh, a long tradition of um, Thai independence, which I'm deeply familiar with having visited Bangkok many times. And to all of our colleagues from the Bank of International Settlements and various central bankers who have gathered in Bangkok for this important occasion. Well, the question you raise about the avoidable war, um, is it a question mark or is it not? I think everything in international politics today is a question mark. Um, so therefore, the purpose of a question mark is to present us with alternatives. And that's where I believe the political leaderships of both China and the United States have choices to make. And the argument I outline in my book is pretty straightforward. Right now, we have a strategic competition between the United States and China, whether we want to call it that or not, that is what's unfolding. And I have a very simple approach to this, which is you can either have unmanaged strategic competition with the rolling risk of accidental uh, crisis, conflict and war, or you can choose as both sides to have managed strategic competition, that is, with certain basic rules of the road, with certain basic strategic guardrails. Or what I see Xi Jinping is saying most recently in his readout from his summit with uh, Joe Biden in Bali, uh, constructing what he describes as an anchemwang, which is a, a security safety net underneath the relationship. And my argument at the end of the day is based on a simple logic that it's in neither country's interests at this stage to trigger an accidental war. Therefore, how do we practically find mechanisms to reduce the risk of that? And the burden of the argument is managed strategic competition is the best way forward. And the book outlines in some detail what that would mean in practice. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I know the way uh, forward, of course, the uh, layout, a uh, framework, uh, can you uh, share with us a little bit more details how the framework will overcome uh, the, uh, the current tensions as we saw it uh, the, uh, in the next two to three years or uh, even for the longer terms? Um, what is, what is the, how it could get involved? Well, uh, my argument is essentially for the next three to five years. Uh, maybe you Chinese have trained me too well, I think, in five-year plans. But, uh, but I'm looking for the short to medium term, which I define as round about five years. I think the first point I would make is that the idea of having managed strategic competition is not an intellectual or academic fantasy. Um, in the days of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, those two superpowers evolved over time, basic rules of the road, basic protocols and procedures, basic um, mechanisms 
uh, to ensure that there were no accidental crises. And so for the subsequent 30 years, we never got to the brink of 1962 again. So I think it's important for us to bear that in mind as a precedent. Secondly, how would you go about doing it in the case of China and the United States? Well, it should be much easier because we are not yet in a Cold War. The economic engagement, as you know, and as the central bankers know well, is comprehensive between the two countries' financial systems, their economic systems, certainly their trading relationships, if no longer their financial direct investment relationships, at least as an order of magnitude. So the practicalities of it are to identify those strategic red line issues, such as Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, Korean Peninsula, cyber and space, where both sides currently have their internally defined red lines. But what happens every day of the week is that these are tested in practice and that's where you have too much metal intersecting with metal. And it can give rise, therefore, to unintended incidents. So my argument is that it's time now for both sides at the senior level, confidentially, uh, to exchange what their irreducible strategic red lines are. So that if the other side crosses them, you know that there will be unintended consequences or significant consequences, I should say. So therefore, argument number one is, allocate time for two teams, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor from the United States and their Chinese equivalents to construct a de minima list of strategic red lines or guardrails within each of those five conflict areas. The second argument with strategic competition is through a joint framework, you could then agree that all other areas of competition should be non-lethal. Uh, namely, uh, that the rest of security policy, foreign policy, economic competition, trade, investment technology, as well as, of course, ideology, where China offers a different set of views in terms of the future of the international system. And then finally, through managed strategic competition, you should also be able to construct sufficient political and diplomatic space for the two sides to still be able to collaborate closely in areas of global public goods. Climate change is obvious, but given the nature of your meeting in Bangkok, maintaining global financial stability is also a global public good, together with pandemic management, together with nuclear non-proliferation. So in a nutshell, that's the argument. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Kevin. Uh, I would like to uh, actually explore more on this, um, but since you mentioned uh, this part of the world, um, the uh, Asian and Pacific regions, um, a lot of things going on, um, other than, of course, the, uh, uh, in, the con in the context of the, uh, the US-China uh, relations, but much more. Um, the, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the technology advances, the uh, transitions to green uh, economies, and also, uh, of course, the uh, economic growth. Um, so, my question is, um, how do you see uh, the Asian Pacific region as a whole uh, in the futures? In other words, do you still see the realizations uh, of the uh, Asian um, uh, centuries uh, as we enter into the 22nd years of the, uh, after the new millennium? Well, the two things that keep me awake at night are geopolitics, China versus US, and climate change. Um, these I regard as two systemic challenges, which have the potential to undermine not just the Indo-Pacific, the Asia-Pacific region, but the world at large in terms of fulfilling their growth and sustainability potential. Across uh, the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific region, my argument is this, if we can manage geopolitics, then the growth trajectories of the region are still robust. Look at China, currently going through a difficult period, but still going to produce reasonable levels of growth into the future. India is rising, and we see therefore India's population probably the same as China's by next year. And with a new growth strategy for India emerging from the Indian government, also one which is now anchored in the principle of sustainability. Turn to Southeast Asia and you look at the emergence of Indonesia, 
um, which has re registered significant growth in recent times at 6 to 7%, a country already moving towards 300 million people, uh, and therefore also a major growth driver in Southeast Asia in the future, together with the other strong economies like Korea, uh, like uh, the Republic of Vietnam, our own country, Australia, etc. Put these together, they still represent a huge engine for global growth uh, for the first half of this century and arguably beyond, if we can manage the geopolitics. If we don't manage the geopolitics and we have a war over Taiwan or anything else, war will fundamentally undermine growth. People often skip over this and they assume that war is somehow something which is over and over in a minute. Well, it's not, uh, as Ukraine demonstrates. And therefore, the untold economic and physical damage uh, that would be done through a war in our region of the type we haven't seen since the Korean War, or possibly the um, war of, uh, of uh, which ended in 1945, the Second World War, uh, this would be catastrophic in terms of regional growth. The second challenge, of course, is what you've already touched on, which is climate change and sustainability. Here I've got to say, that the Asia Pacific has been slow. China, a decade ago, was not doing much. China is now doing quite a lot. Uh, and there has been a sea change in China's strategy, though all of us want China to do more, currently is the world's largest emitter. The country we're most worried about, apart from China, is India, where the decision to move towards sustainability has been late and the transformation of their coal-fired capabilities to renewables has been slow, although Prime Minister Modi has indicated an accelerated timetable for doing that. Uh, when I look at Indonesia, it is also slow, although they've been encouraging signs coming out of President Widodo at the Bali G20 summit recently concluded. And the other major economies of the region, Australia, Japan, and Korea, need to lift their game. You see, between us, these economies that I've just mentioned, by the time we get towards mid-century, we will, between us, represent more than half of global emissions. And that leaves out the United States and leaves out the Europeans. So at present in the Asia Society, I chair an independent commission on getting Asia to net zero. We've done a report already of econometric modeling on India doing that. We've just done one on Indonesia doing that. We'll be doing one on China soon. And what our argument is, is that this transition of executed effectively over the next five to seven years can be done with enormous upside for the economy and while still managing the transition costs. I think they're the two big challenges and alternatives and opportunities uh, for the Asia Pacific region for uh, the first half of this century. Well, that is very clear. Uh, in terms of what is the future challenges, as you just outlined. Um, if we uh, uh, pull back a little bit, um, just look at the, uh, what happened in the last few decades. Um, this region, the Asia and the Pacific region, has tremendously benefited from opening up and uh, economic and financial interconnectedness, um, both within the regions and with the rest of the world. So in your observation now, uh, do you see that the globalization is in retreat uh, or uh, reshaping? And of course, how the opening up and international interconnectedness can be more beneficial to uh, this region and of course to the entire world uh, as well on a more uh, sustainable uh, footing. Uh, here, of course, um, particular point because I uh, uh, come from the uh, uh, international uh, organizations, uh, we, the BIS I'm currently work with. So my particular concern or interest is how uh, these multilateral uh, institutions can um, uh, can uh, do a better job uh, in terms of supporting uh, the multilateralism. As for the future of globalization, as we all know, and the central bankers fully understand, 
Um, the enormous economic dividend of uh, economic globalization is there for us all to see. Really over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War, globalization has contributed to unprecedented economic development, lifting so many people out of poverty. Look at China itself and look at what's happening now in India and Southeast Asia. Um, that the benefits of globalization, the opening up of new trade markets, the opening up of new investment flows, the opening up of capital markets, uh, the emergence of uh, dynamic venture capital industries, for example, uh, to capitalize on the new technologies. Uh, this is writing a brand new chapter uh, in the history of global economic growth. When we look at the whole spectrum of international economic history, uh, at least over the last 500 years, now, of course, our old friend geopolitics comes back and geopolitics, regrettably, um, is launching a torpedo at the globalization project. It may not kill globalization, but it is slowing it down. Secondly, it also may produce two globalizations. You may have uh, Chinese style globalization, and you may have American style globalization, uh, each anchored in its own currency, perhaps over time. When I look at Chinese style globalization, look very carefully at the rollout of digital commerce and digital finance um, and digital exchange uh, through China and in particular the Belt and Road Initiative countries right across the world. There you can begin to see a pattern of, shall we say, globalized activity occurring within that framework. But increasingly, it's being separated from uh, the rest of the world, anchored in, shall we say, uh, American classical forms of globalization anchored in the US dollar. Now, these trends are only just beginning. They could become much more accelerated, and we end up with these two polarizing globalization concepts. And that's where globalization ceases to be truly globalization. Again, the ultimate solution lies in geopolitics. And unless we can manage strategic competition between the two majors, the US and China, then I regret we'll either have two forms of globalization or we'll have a retreat to economic nationalism, which is even worse, um, and return to various forms of economic autarky. The cry in all countries, including in China itself, to secure our national supply chains uh, for national security purposes is now heard in every country in the world, including, I've got to say, when I read Xi Jinping's report to the 20th Party Congress, as well as in regular statements in the United States Congress, as well as statements in every country in the world. So globalization very much is at the crossroads. Well, thank you. Yeah, I understand you. The, you, you outlined uh, the globalization could be in the different forms or even have uh, two types of the globalizations uh, running on its own footing. Um, but even that uh, can be the case and how sustainable that would be because as we see it, globalization is a cross-border uh, movement. And so uh, if indeed there's a two systems to separate globalizations, uh, take, the diff take, take their own course. Um, how these two courses could interact and how the, the rest of the world, other than the United States and China, would participate into these two um, simultaneously running uh, globalizations? Well, there are two strategic alternatives and probably three. I hinted at them before. One is through huge effort in overcoming geopolitics, we sustain a single globalization project, albeit a reformed one, uh, because it's got to take into account various inequalities, as well as taking into account ESG, and in particular, sustainability. The second alternative is the one we are beginning to default towards, which is these two competing sets of globalizations, which I don't think will produce the same level of global growth or good outcomes for the planet. And the third is even worse, which is a retreat, as I said, to various forms of national self-reliance and almost autarky driven by protectionism. 
My argument would be that the time has come for the international institutions uh, to actually uh, rise to the challenge here. National political constituencies will always answer to their national um, uh, voter base or electoral base. In the case of the Communist Party, it's membership base. But the bottom line is international institutions are brought into being to manage the global commons, whether it's the World Trade Organization, whether it's International Monetary Fund, uh, whether it's the World Bank, or whether uh, it is also other institutions such as the G20 or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. You see, these institutions, in my argument, now need to speak with their own voice. I know they're constructed by national governments. I've been in the business of national political life myself, and I've worked with these institutions over a long period of time. But the world needs the voices of uh, multilateralism, of globalization, as well as arguments in favor of managing the global public good, because the national voices addressed to that are becoming quieter. Let me give you one classic example, which goes beyond the remit of the central banks. But let's look at the future of global trade. The truth is, global trade uh, has not been growing as rapidly as it has in the past. And in some stages, we have seen contraction, albeit induced by crises such as the pandemic. The World Trade Organization, to be blunt, has been quite silent in this, and it's almost become ineffective in discharging its mandate. Now, the WTO will say that's the problem of national member states. That's an argument. But it now requires bold leadership by the heads of these institutions, IMF, WTO, uh, the rotating presidency of the G20, uh, as well as the World Bank, to reclaim the ground for globalization with the argument, the logic, and the advantages to be delivered by it. Back to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, that's very thoughtful. And of course, the thank you so much for sharing with us your uh, insight and the, all of these uh, wonderful analysis. Um, all of these will be shared with my colleagues at the central banks and of course, BIS. So with that, uh, we, we talk quite a bit uh, about the geopolitical uh, tensions um, uh, in our conversation today. So one question is, of course, the, uh, uh, from, from my colleagues at the central banks um, or BIS to you might be, what can uh, central, bank, central banks do um, with their defined mandate, of course, um, uh, to help cushion uh, the spillovers uh, from the geopolitical tensions um, on the national, regional uh, and uh, global economies in a sense that you know, the central banks as a whole, particularly uh, the, uh, for example, the BIS as a, uh, the, uh, the bank work for these central banks, how we can better uh, perform the work to provide the uh, international public goods as you just described. Well, the great advantage of the central banks and again, I extend my greetings to all of you gathered in Bangkok, is you all speak the same language. Uh, you all speak the common language, not just of economics, but you also speak the language of financial economics. And there is something about the language of economics and the language of financial economics is that it actually transcends nationalism because it speaks to a common global economic logic. Unfortunately, geopolitics is not like that. Geopolitics, and the language of geopolitics is invariably national. And as a consequence, uh, it's limited in its ability to deal with the challenges of globalization. Secondly, for the central banks in particular, you have a great mandate in terms of warning, jinggao is the Chinese word. And I remember this carefully from the um, uh, global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. The central banks have a central uh, responsibility to warn the global political class when we see the evidence of an emerging global systemic financial crisis. The political leadership of our various countries will not be attuned to that. The central bankers, always one step removed from central politics, um, will have their fingers on the pulse in terms of any emerging systemic financial risk. 
Of course, you know that as a result of the uh, global financial crisis, we established the Financial Stability Board. And we know that the Financial Stability Board also works with the Basel Committee, and I'm sure with the Bank of International Settlements as well. Now, uh, the purpose behind our decision to establish the FSB, built on the original FSC, was that we wanted the, the central banks and the central, shall we say, finance institutions of the world from the major economies to be able to do two things, warn us of emerging crises. Secondly, advise us as to what should be done to head those crises off. And thirdly, to put in place various measures to prevent such crises, such as we did with the um, whole rat raft of reforms brought in by the FSB from capital adequ adequacy ratios through to too big to fail to the rest. This is an important continuing slab of work. My last point would be for central banks is that everyone's um, statute establishing each uh, one another's central banks will differ, but often they have a mandate in terms of maintaining full employment or uh, ensuring uh, manageable low inflation uh, in terms of overall macroeconomic stability. In other words, to sustain growth and employment or uh, to slay the inflationary demon when it emerges. Now, for a lot of the last um, 20 or 30 years, when the banks have been called upon, it's usually been inflationary. How do we enhance demand to deal with crises which have emerged by one reason or another, which have depressed global demand, increased unemployment, such as what happened during the GFC? Now, of course, we have the reverse challenge, the global inflationary challenge. Uh, therefore, the challenge now, of course, is to defeat the inflationary beast, because we know too well the history of the 70s and the 80s to ever want to return to that again. But as you know, as central bank professionals, it's having these three disciplines in mind, keeping inflation under control, because the political class will never be able to do that effectively, whatever they may say about their fiscal disciplinary intentions. Second, ensuring that when downturns occur, that demand around the world is sustained uh, through um, appropriate uh, Keynesian measures, appropriate Keynesian measures. But thirdly, to also keep a razor sharp lens on systemic financial stability. I argue that is a continuing global good, which should form part of the US-China relationship in the future as well, given that global financial instability would be devastating for both. Great, wonderful, uh, Kevin. I wish um, we could continue our conversations, but I realized uh, that I am running out of your time uh, today. Uh, so thank you once again uh, for talking with us. And we're looking forward to welcoming you again uh, in future occasions. Thank you. Look forward very much to doing so. And I'm sorry I can't be with you Bangkok in the flesh on this occasion, but I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Goodbye now. Bye-bye.